focus on this talk today is basically we tried at the time to start as a mission captain there and then eventually became a uh, major, which sort of carried with them to his death. Um, and started off here, we sort of start with this is a signature of, of uh, of course, Major William Trent here. But the the seal that we see here, uh, believe it or not, this is dated 17, I believe, 68, 69. And this is from when William Trent joined with George Crowen and a few others, including uh, the last governor of New Jersey, William Franklin, who was the son of Benjamin Franklin. And this is part of the Burlington Company was their sort of business uh, seal. A lot of people had their personal seals. Um, trying to did as well. But this one here is actually the business seal of the Burlington Company. Consequently, this is the seal is a picture of George III. So giving that a, a, an idea here in 1768, uh, you know, Trent along with, uh, sort of cut out here, but it basically Crone would sign as well and also have the same exact seal as well. So at that time, I mean, we have to you know, understand, you know, as far as who or where the loyalties lie, you know, up to a certain point, at least till the revolution broke out, you know, everybody, not everybody was already, you know, flipping over to, um, uh, to the, either the Patriot cause or the, you know, at the time, the loyalists. So just going back to, like I said, we're focusing on, as it starts to off here, because I started with this sort of slide here just because with the King George III, like you said, at the time, you know, not ever, most people, at least at the time, with the exception of maybe the merchants that were opposed to the Stamp Act and then the repeal of the Stamp Act and then eventually the taxes that almost came every year up until the revolution began. Um, William Trent, as far as with this, was just looking to hopefully get back his restitution or retribution of all these suffering, you know, losses that he suffered from. Uh, his previous conflicts, and I'm going to go into that here. But like I said, it's just I thought it was funny to see this here, you know, where we look here at the seal because that was George III. Whereas uh, William Franklin, one of the members of this Burlington Company, uh, when in fact the rendered a loyalist and actually uh, thrown in prison uh, in 1776 uh, for his uh, loyalist uh, allegiance. So at this time, I mean, like I said, business was business when you were a merchant or a trader. So at this time, especially being the previous, um, you know, everybody was trying to just try to make it through here, especially at this time period, you know, 1760s on, as we sort of get the, uh, when we sort of jump between the uh, Patriot and the Loyalists. So we want to start with who was William Trent? We know, like I said, you know, Judge Trent, you know, we're standing in the visitor center, you know, where the house is, in the vicinity of the house. But he was, you know, Major William Trent, and I basically he was born. From what I based on the sources, we have not, I've been not able to find a, a baptismal certificate or even a mention of when his birth was. But based on uh, when he did his apprenticeship in Pennsylvania and the laws of Pennsylvania saying that um, he had to complete by he was twenty one years of age and was not allowed to leave Philadelphia until that was completed. So about the spring or so, 1743, you have to remember the, uh, at the time, the new year um, in the old calendar was March. So at that point, that's why I have it sort of the 1721 or 22. Uh, so it looked like the spring of 1743, uh, Trent was eventually uh, relieved Philadelphia and completed his apprenticeship. Um, and like I said, his death in December 1st, 1784. And he was the son of Mary Coddington. This, this right here is an original uh, author copied the original signature on a Quaker wedding certificate. If you've ever researched, if you know of anybody that was ever uh, part of a you know, Quaker family and stuff, if you're ever trying to find research, the best thing to look is at a Quaker wedding. Because all the people that attended the wedding would sign the, the wedding certificate if it exists. And this one was from 1706. So this was a 13-year-old Mary Coddington, Trent's mother, um, or eventually Trent's mother. Um, attending the wedding of Ann Shippen, Edward Shippen, a very well-known merchant in Philadelphia, his daughter Mary Thomas Story um, in the Philadelphia there. And then, of course, uh, the son of Judge William, Judge William Trent, and as you can see, that's his signature right here as well. And like I said, Trent was a veteran of three different conflicts, and I, I say three different because the first one was sort of a precursor to the French and Indian. It was the King George's War. A lot of people don't know about it because it only lasted about four years. 
And it basically lasted from 1744 to about 1748. It only lasted basically in the colonies and possibly into Canada a little bit. Um, Trent was hired at the time to be uh, commissioned captain, believe it or not, the British Army. was was received actually part of like an independent company commission, uh, being that he was paid directly from the king. Um, in Philadelphia, one of these men, of course, was an ensign, young 16-year-old William Franklin. So that relationship sort of, <laughs> sort of went, uh, you know, went over. In fact, uh, William Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's son, William, would eventually uh, maintain his friendship, Jesus, until over even throughout as the Revolutionary War started. And of course, the second conflict uh, we have was the French and Indian War. And Trent was involved with trying to build the first English outpost. Um, uh, at that time, he, he served as the factor, sort of the account keeper and, and bookkeeper for the Ohio Company. So he kept all the records and accounts. Um, and this is what led him to build the first English outpost there in the spring of 1754. And that sort of uh, trying to build there, what we know today, the city of Pittsburgh, eventually led to tensions boiling over. Um, and then um, the French Union War, the first shots happening almost uh, about a month later, there at the what they call the skirmish at Jamonville Glen there in May of 1754. And then, of course, the third one, and like I said, he served as the factor for the Ohio Company here. And that was one of the few signatures he had of where he actually signed at the bottom the factor for the Ohio Company. Um, and the third conflict I have is what they basically called sort of the indigenous insurrection or what was known as the Pontiac's Uprising. Uh, there is, as General Amherst, the commander in chief of the United States, or at the time, the future United States or, or North America at the time, um, Amherst would enlist these policies to sort of revoke the present giving to all the uh, Native peoples, and then as well as uh, revoking that they should they actually stopped trade at one point. And of course, by doing so, the, the indigenous, uh, those in the area there of of what would be the future Western Pennsylvania and other regions uh, throughout the Great Lakes and different things would rebel against this or sort of uh, launch an insurrection uh, for what General Amherst would blame Chief Pontiac for, um, but, and also name the this sort of uprising for it. But uh, in fact, it was another uh, a brief, as you could say, because it lasted barely a year, uh, an Indian insurrection sort of to uh, rebel against the men that had the forts and outposts. Um, and Strent as well would be the commander of the militia for Pitt. That would make him a veteran of that conflict as well. And like I said, he was considered a backcountry merchant. A lot of people refer to him as a trader, but back then, especially in Virginia or Pennsylvania, um, you had to have a license to trade. And Trent never really called himself a trader. Um, he mostly launched himself into firms that traded with traders or hired traders. Um, and so basically, just like the few he would get his supplies from Philadelphia, from merchants, and then also from London and where else. Um, he was considered, considering him and George Crone, another uh, fellow off and on again partner that he served with, um, would basically sell these goods to the, the indigenous or the settlers or you know, if there were outposts. So that, you know, based, based on that information, he would be considered a, a backcountry merchant. So as we start here and, and sort of focusing on uh, the revolution here, uh, or at the beginning of the revolution. So in April of 1769, uh, Trent would move his family uh, to Trent. And at that time, uh, Major William Trent, uh, his wife, Sarah, and had five children at the time. Um, and they were very young children. In fact, one was John, the, the, the youngest, was at that time uh, just a year old when they moved to Trent. And he would move there in 1769 because he would mortgage off the houses and stuff he would have in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And he would start to so he'd gather some different things and such. So he was heading to uh, London because him and a few others were trying to get back that I mentioned that retribution or restitution for the past wars from the French and Indian, from the Indian uprising. Trent was in debt for thousands of pounds, uh, you know, possibly into almost millions today in American money. So at that time, he wanted to hopefully uh, get that back. And by doing so, he would have to receive royal approval uh, by sailing to London. And I have this thing right here just to throw, you know, every so often all these slides will have pictures. This one here is, believe it or not, is the original Trent Clock. And it still exists today. In fact, I was fortunate enough to see it. Uh, it was, it's resist, exists in New Jersey, and it still stands there. It, it dates... Um, to about, I would say, from what they were dating on the 1750s. 
uh, when he had this made in Philadelphia by clockmaker John Wood. Um, and it's, uh, like I said, it stands, when I saw it, it stands about, it's close to almost eight feet tall. Where is it? It is in a place called Historic Peachfield, which run by the Colonial Dames of New Jersey. It's uh, between Burlington and here, Burlington, New Jersey and here. Um, and I was fortunate enough to see this, in, you know, as right as the uh, pandemic sort of broke out. So, um, and then as we have here, we uh, this is the, the ship and the advertisement that Trent would sail on when he sailed to London. Uh, he would leave in April 1769. I think it's set on here. Even it says the 10th, but I believe it was a little bit late. It depended on how many people for passage. So what they would do is in Philadelphia, they would advertise the you know, tickets or passages that were going on. So for this one, uh, Trent would sail on what was called the Betsy under Captain Seymour Hood. But it was interesting because this is the original um, ad for it, uh, sailing to Bristol, England uh, in the Pennsylvania Gazette, uh, the, you know, the newspaper that Franklin read. So as he sails to London there, he has, what he writes is, he says, a most unpleasant voyage, he would write in a letter. And he would write in Bristol. The first thing he would do is he would, he would go to London to go to Dr. Franklin's house. Today, if you visit it, Dr. Franklin's house still exists. It's in, uh, right in downtown London there on Craven Street. It's called the Craven Street House. If you ever look that up, you can actually see Trump was entertained there a lot with Ben Franklin, along with Samuel Martin, another uh, fellow uh, a Philadelphia merchant that he joined with. And as they were sort of go to uh, London to sort of get this and you know, go before the royal courts to get this restitution royal approval, uh, they realize that they're going to have to make friends over there. You think this was 1769, there's tensions boiling over in the colonies and in London because of what's happening in the colonies. So they decide with the help from Thomas Walpole and other members of parliament and friends over there that they make in London, Ben Franklin, Walpole, Samuel Martin, William Trent, they form another company called Grand Ohio Company. So now they not only have met members from, uh, from the area of the colonies, but also from London. And they promised them sort of a, uh, basically a percentage of what they were getting if in fact they were able to form this and figured this would help with their royal approval. And as they were going before the courts, uh, William Trent would have, as well as Ben Franklin, and as well as Samuel Martin, because uh, they would actually, um, Trent would write in one of his letters, uh, I believe in, in, it was in July of 1769, that he, he would remark about Samuel Martin's silk uh, coat that he had made and Benjamin Franklin's. And even uh, when he wrote to George Crone in the colonies, he, he had remarked that how Quaker Samuel Martin looked nothing like a Quaker. He was... He was dressed and he's wearing a sword and presenting himself to the royal courts. So it was an interesting thing to have. But so to give you an idea of what the courts, this was the, of course, this is here at the Trent House. And this is the gentleman's court coat that Trent had made. Um, this was given here by uh, William Trent's great granddaughter, Anna Russell. And it was eventually, uh, like I said, it was designed or made by a London tailor. Is this type of uh, you know craftsmanship as far as doing it, we can see a focus here on the pocket. Um, this type of craftsmanship had to be done in London. These gentlemen's court coats that were made, or coats he would make specifically uh, for uh, to present themselves to the royal court. And this one, the Court of St James, is what they call it then. This was the pre-Buckingham Palace type thing. So at the time, St James Palace was the place that he would present. So they called it the Court of St James. Um, so at this time, they all would have London tailors. Now, as far as research comes, I've yet to find who the London tailor was that made it. But just recently here in the last couple of weeks, I was able to find based on the uh, design uh, you know, here on the pocket and also you know, down the buckets, the uh, buttons here, uh, that it was probably designed by silk weavers based on the patterns in what was called the Spitalfields District of London probably circa 1774, based on the patterns and what they have. Uh, the curator of the Victorian Albert Museum is able to sort of consult on that with me after I showed her the pictures. Um, and it was a great thing to add on to what we already know, uh, that he definitely would have worn this at the, the Court of St. James. Um, and, but it was designed specifically because there was only one district that they actually designed these type of coats, and it was in Spittlesville. And to give you an idea, we have... Uh, this was Spitalfields here. This is the Tower of London, like downtown London would be here, just to give you an idea of the dimensions. We have the Thames right here, 
the tower of London and above this was the Spitalfields district. This was sort of a marketplace of the silk weavers, and most most of them were from France. They were they were French Huguenots that came and uh, probably like the 1740s on, and eventually would um, like I said settle in this district and would design not only coats for the gentlemen that were presenting for royal coats, but probably for Parliament and, and other things. So to give you an idea, this is a painting done. Uh, Later in the 1800s, but this shows Benjamin Franklin right here at the court of St. James. And this gives you an idea of what it sort of looked like. This was called the cockpit. Uh, Henry VIII used to have cockfights there with roosters and stuff, but it was that's what it was nicknamed uh, after they ended up using it for St. James Palace. And this was to give an idea. This was when uh, this was actually 1774, where Benjamin Franklin in this painting was presented before the court. Uh, because he was accused of giving information uh, of what was going on in Britain to the men in the colonies. And of course, Franklin denied this, was sort of put on trial. They sort of, Franklin didn't really get to speak. He just sort of got berated in front of everybody here at the court. But this, I use this because just to give an idea of what the court of St. James with, there is a possibility of looking at this. It's hard to identify any of the people in here, but according to my research, based on the paintings that we know, obviously there's, there's none that I found, at least of William Trent. But this one here supposedly is, could pop Samuel Wharton. This one is Edward Bancroft, another uh, man that was a friend of Benjamin Franklin and also of Trent. Uh, so it is a possibility that this person here could possibly be Major William Trent at this uh, thing here as he sort of came to uh, be with uh, Franklin here. So as they're there and they sort of present themselves to the royal court, the, the filing after, you know, you figure at this time, 1769, uh, Trent is there almost to 1775, so six years he has to spend in London. After he writes in 70, 1769 in June that it'll only be a few months and he'll be home. Uh, six years later, uh, you know, he's still trying to, you know, warn an audience that they would listen to him. And finally, by 1774 and 75, the Parliament and the, the Privy Council and, and those at the Court of St. James do listen and say, you just have to go home and claim it. And you can do it. You know, it's something he probably should have hoped, you know, realized he could have probably done about six years ago. But so at this time, they decide that if they are going to get restitution or retribution for these suffering losses, now this includes the French Indian War in 1754 and 56, and then also the sufferers that suffered separately. There were some that were on both lists, but not all of them. But there were some that decided to, uh, just for their 1763 losses, Trent was on both lists, so he had a ton of debt to, to get back. They decided to propose a 14th colony. So they were getting land. They weren't necessarily getting the money back. But the land was worth almost 80,000 pounds. So this was more than what the debt proposed was that they submitted originally to the royal thing. Now, they decide, well, they could propose a colony of land and have it separate. One could be called Indiana for their sufferers. Another one could be called uh, Delia. And they call it Delia because of this person here. This is Queen Charlotte, uh, you know, King George III's wife. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually watched Richardson and seen the, you know, see the thing about how she's portrayed. And she's a great character on there. And, and the thing, it's ironic because the first, my thoughts, judging that I'm not trying to write this book, I'm going to try and, but I, you know, doing that and, and how the sort of uh, accuracy of, of of, of Queen Charlotte, you know, instead of her thing, they call it Vandalia not only to please her, but to because supposedly Queen Charlotte had she was descendant of Vandalia tribesmen, and those tribesmen were from Africa, northern Africa, and that's why Trent and the men there, uh, Thomas Walpole, uh, uh, Franklin, and the rest of them in that group of the Grand Ohio Company. Uh, began to uh, sort of a piece, a piece to her, realizing that with this royal brand and calling it Vandalia, this will honor Queen Charlotte and the rest of the support her. And the original name they had was Pennsylvania, believe it or not. They named it after William Pitt. Um, you know, of course, we, we know today Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania was named for uh, William Pitt, at the time, William Pitt the Elder. And they decided to name William Pitt the Younger for Pennsylvania, but that happened like 1769, 1770 sort of proposal. But as they finally got an audience for the uh, Royal Parliament there, they eventually would change to Vandalia to hopefully appease uh, Queen Charlotte. And in this, they, they 
we try and then propose that the capital be in Fort Pitt or, or at Pittsburgh. Um, there were numerous times in Fort Pitt, Fort Pitt then, and it was still known as Pittsburgh. So it's funny when, when they write it, especially even at that time, uh, trend at the time, I mean, 1769, 1770, almost to the time he returns, they were still calling it Pittsburgh and Fort Pitt. And Samuel Wharton was elected to be the governor, the proposed governor of Vandal. So you have to remember the confidence they had, knowing that they had this royal grant, that they were going to do this colony called Vandalia. They were going to have the capital be in Pittsburgh, and they were going to have Stephen Martin already as the governor. In fact, he would even write letters, Stephen Martin would write letters, saying he was sending seeds home to plant his garden he was going to have at his governor's house. And to give you an idea, there's the plans for his mansion that he already had designed in London to go in Pittsburgh when he was elected governor of Vandalia. And he talks about numerous things, like these are the chamber rooms here, and I have a chimney here. And he goes all about that. And like I said, he does, he says he's going to save seeds. But unfortunately, like I said, by the time they're able to do this, and this is to give you an idea of where it would be today. Now, like I said, we have the capital sort of on the border, but that would over sort of oversee. This became the Indiana was sort of the suffers from uh, 1763. And these so they separated. Basically, what it was is the 1763 went uh, through this part here, what they called Indiana, and then they had Vandalia, which was suffered from the French and Indian War as well. So we had not only Pennsylvania, we had a little bit of Maryland here, uh, what would be later West Virginia. At the time, it was still Virginia. And then, of course, the actual state of Virginia. Then, even if uh, we see it sort of the Ohio River was sort of the border. So at this point, uh, underneath here, it was sort of the parts of Kentucky. So it was a vast, like I said, it went miles and miles on this, is what they were trying to propose to claim. Um, but unfortunately, as, as Trent and then decide to finally come home and realize that they got what they wanted, you had people like Virginia. Settlers were already moving into these areas that were supposedly unsettled, uh, that were basically, uh, and they were starting to settle there. They were getting letters already in 74 and 75 that people were settling there. And at that point, they realize he's going to have to head home. And he realizes because if they're going to have to lay claim to it, they have to do so before the settlers do. At this point, like I said, the Virginians are laying claim. Uh, George Washington, you know, of course, a veteran of the French and Indian War. Uh, a lot of the um, things they got for, for fighting and joining the Virginia Regiment there, according to the Proclamation of 1754, a lot of their land grants were in this thing here. So that also proposed, proposed the problem as well. His former clerk, and he went in and he had combined to make another company, sort of trying to forget the previous company. But you know, in Virginia, it's back to how do companies still run? Uh, George Mason, those so they proposed to where they fit in this equation as far as everything. So Trent would come home, like I said, he moved his family to Trenton. And he would basically, this will give you an idea of where he moved. He, he moved it on what was, what was known before him as the former Thomas Lambert plantation. Now, into, and I'll show you sort of a, a, a thing today on where, where it stands here. This would be where we are right here. Okay, you can see the Delaware River. And this would be the, where the Trent House, this is another map showing when Malin Stacy, the original um, and founder of eventually would be Trent's town. Basically, Quaker settlement would be here, and then he would, his son would sell to Judge Trent. So that would be here. Well, eventually down here about, believe it or not, about two, two miles or so. It's a lot further today based on the, you know, the land terrain and roads we have built today. But according to when Trent would write it and would buy it, he would say it was only about two miles from the what he considered the, the main, you know, the main town or main city of Trent. And today, this is like we have here. This is the Thomas Lambert house, which Major Trent would eventually build his house right here. And this was sort of the, according to this, this was a ridge that uh, did everything right here. Now, it sort of had a, it was elevated up. So when you actually stand there in this vicinity, this is right around present day uh, Layler Street in Trenton, sort of South Trenton. And today, there's, if you follow that off of Jeremiah Avenue, the Property, the original property is a Ukrainian legion now, um, today. And, and like I said, it sits on a ridge. Now, if you go further there towards the river, you follow the street back, you run into Riverview Cemetery. For those of you familiar in the area, 
Burberry Cemetery. Now, Burberry Cemetery, of course, is a you know, a past um, uh, cemetery. But at the time, they didn't have Burberry didn't exist at a major trend time, and even before then, they had burial, just a burying ground, what they call just either a quaking burial ground or sometimes known as the Thomas Lambert burying ground because his past, his father, and most of the family were buried here. Uh, today in Riverview Cemetery, if you drive towards the past, in fact, towards almost the back, where you can see the river right here in the present day picture. Um, in fact, John Roebling, the you know the Brooklyn Bridge innovator, is buried right here. There's this part here. This is what's left of the present day burying ground, Thomas Lambert. Um, and today, obviously, Quaker burying ground. A lot of them didn't have a, they don't have graves marked; it's just stones. But it definitely is where they where they are uh, today. Where you, you know, as far as you can do it. Now, when Trent took over then, so this is back on the map, like I said, we, we show here that he would then purchase this Thomas Lambert plantation. Um, when he returned, he pretty much leased it. Uh, he didn't buy it in full because it was a vast plantation. It had six, almost 700 acres. I said 670, what it was listed as. It was listed as head of the tide, uh, according to the, um, the description of it on the Delaware River. And, but at this time, before he bought it from Elijah Bond in 1777 fully, when he was leasing it from him, Bond had already started a ferry. Ferry he had called the New Ferry. And the New Ferry, believe it or not, was, was right here. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i have an arrow here come up too as well. And he started this in 1773. It would cross then to the Pennsylvania side, of course, and it would be run by the Pennsylvania ferry, ferryman named John Sport. And there was an advertisement actually in the Pennsylvania Gazette at this time, of the advertisement of the new ferry. But this also posed problems because not even a half mile to a mile up in here, it's not labeled on this map, but there was another ferry. And that ferry, of course, was the ferry run originally by Judge Trent's son and Major Trent's older half-brother, James Trent, back in the 1720s. 1726, he patented the first ferry there. And then it sort of boomed. As soon as the settlement grew, they, more and more ferries came up. But this passed hands of whoever was running this, this uh, the, the William Trent, former William Trent house. And as it passed hands, Robert Cooper, the last uh, at this time in 1769, uh, would sell to Daniel Cox. And Daniel Cox would run the ferry uh, right here. And he actually patented the government saying, that, you know, I run this ferry here. Why are we, why is Elijah Vaughn allowed to run a ferry here? I mean, this was the thing, as he said, almost in the records, about a half mile to a mile away. And it posed a problem. So when Trent bought this, knowing full well, there was another ferry you know, right up in here, not too far away to the north there on the Delaware. So on this, like I said, on this plantation that he had, he would originally start with, according to the tax rates, nine horses, 35 horned cattle, 20 hogs, and one enslaved person. He did actually have an indentured servant as well. Uh, when, when William Trent and Samuel Warren would travel before they went to England, uh, they would go for the Treaty of Sandwich, and they would meet Sir William Johnson in New London, Connecticut, eventually go to Albany, and Trent would sign a 12-year contract with an indentured servant named Christian Rodabaugh, and he would send him back to, uh, to basically he'd teach him to read and write, but he would also uh, sort of apprentice off him as sort of a mer merchant apprentice, but also do the, the work around um, this plantation here. Um, sort of a, a side note to that letter, uh, Sarah Trent, his wife, would actually sell the indentured servant in 1774 uh, to Elijah Bond, maybe to help him as he uh, was running the, uh, the ferry there in 1774. So Elijah Bond ran the ferry to almost 75, 1776. Um, and eventually, like I said, when he bought the plantation there, as you can see the property in the survey, it was, like I said, 670 acres plus the ferry. Now, you have to understand, a lot was changing. Trent returned only to find, like I said, in 1775, this is June. So at this time, Trent would actually write that the you know, Battle of Lexington Conquer has already broken out in, you know, near Boston. Um, the Battle of Bunker Hill, Bunker Hill was taking place in 75 when he returned. So he's just finding out about this conflict. And it's the absolute worst timing to try to claim that previous land of Mandelia and such. So on this land here, and not only to add to that thing here, he, while he was gone, his mother Mary, that began to live with him in Trenton, she was in her advanced age, um, was in her late 70s, dies December 15, 1772, while he's still in London. And she eventually, uh, according to the records at St. Michael's Church in Trenton, uh, 
was considered there in the death records there. It's believed that she's probably buried along uh, beside Judge Church, who believes the in Hopewell Cemetery where the former Hopewell Church was on the 1720s, uh, just north of here, right on the grounds of where the Trent Psychiatric Hospital is. There was a uh, graveyard there today. Um, and also, not only that, he would lose a daughter as well, Martha, because when he write a will going home in 1775, uh, he doesn't mention her. Uh, he talks about five children in a previous letter in 1772, and then after that, uh, he doesn't mention her getting a share. He mentioned all the rest of his kids. So it looks to believe that Martha, and then eventually in a will in 1782, he would write when he got very sick, um, she would also not be mentioned. So it's, it's believed then Martha would probably die in her teens uh, at that point before he returned. Uh, Martha was born there uh, in 1759, so she was about 13 or 14 when she passed. Um, so, because at the time, like I said, the Revol Revolutionary War breaks out. Uh, Anne, his, his eldest, is 20. Mary is 14. 12 year old Sarah, and this is in 1777. 12 year old Sarah, and then eight year old John. And to show you, like I said, that's the house would have been right there. Um, and that's where the ferry would have been. Today, if you would look, if you go where the Quaker burial ground is and you look down, you can see where the ridge sort of goes down. So you can see at this point, this, today this would be where the Liberty Cemetery is. So it would be more towards the east there. And then this was sort of like the terrain that shows that sort of like a, a ridge that it sits on. And that still sort of lies today because down here where the ferry house would be is, is Marine Terminal Park. And I'll show you a, a sort of modern day picture of that today. But that park sits and you can actually see, uh, going back here real quick, um, if you sit at Marine Terminal and look back toward Riverview, it's a high ridge that it sits on. So it's sort of definitely increased. The terrain hasn't changed too much since then. So as he's living here and leasing this house, of course, we have the Battle of Trent. Now, Trent doesn't necessarily play a direct role, but you have to understand, like I said, where he had the lower ferry and where the ferry was, was probably at the most within a mile and a half, two miles of where the actual battle was fought. And then the second battle, of course, uh, January 2nd. 1777, called the Second Battle of Trenton, or the Battle of Espoon Creek. So, at that time, you know, just to show how close everything was, Daniel Cox, who I mentioned about, ran the ferry less than a mile away. The ferry house that was built by his brother, James Trent, was destroyed by Hessians. And that was almost less than a mile away, the ferry, in what they called the Flaherty Plantation. Um, and that was destroyed, as well as Daniel Cox's property that he, he had between this property that we're sitting here today, the William Trent House property, and um, uh, where he lived in what is now like present-day Lamberton area or South Trenton. And there were also uh, Hessians camps right here on these grounds of the Trent House. At the time, it was run by Dr. William Bryant. Um, and the doctor actually had the Hessians camped on his lawn here uh, in case as a sort of a, uh, an alarm in case they would be attacked. Uh, little did they know what would happen when Washington crossed the Delaware. And it said when Washington did cross and took over Trenton, those ones that were on this lawn here at the William Trent House were retreat to Bordentown. And there was only one, one road that, that left from that house. You were crossing uh, down and it, to Bordentown, and that would be right across Trent's property. So the road that went across, or at least in the vicinity of the borders of his property, we go back really quick. This was sort of the uh, the road that came down. You see Crosswick's road right here. This road would have come. This is still part of that land up and through here. So this part here, when the Hessians came down, they would cross right through there. So to give you an idea how close that was. So eventually then, as that sort of took off, Trent would run what was known then as, he would call not only, he would sign his letters as the lower ferry. He was the lowest ferry that was out there. But eventually it would be known as the Continental Ferry. And like I said, Trent would take over because the ferry operator, Elijah Vaughn, would have 1773 to 75. Uh, eventually he would give it to ferry operator Thomas Harvey. Thomas Harvey would give it to would eventually sell it to Trent as he bought the property there uh, officially in 1777. Trent would write, that in addition to having the ferry boats, he also planned to build a shallop. And the shallop was something like this. It was like a larger size, like a rowboat or any type thing. Um, this was basically based on a, a uh, 18th century one, type of one. He wanted it because he wanted to have 
at his landing of where he had this lower ferry. So hopefully, um, sell goods from it too. So he not only would have a business of charging people to go across the Delaware, but he could also go to Philadelphia. He'd go to places and sell from his. He had a drying electric store that he could sell whatever he needed to Philadelphia or those passing through. Um, but he also, like I said, he got the nickname Continental Ferry because he offered reduced rates uh, for soldiers in active duty. It was sort of the uh, uh, today when we have the military rates. Now, whether or not Trent is the first for starting a military discount, it's hard to say, but you know, he did offer a reduced rate for soldiers, and including he did mention in one letter, uh, Daniel Morgan and others coming from the Battle of Saratoga in 1777 uh, had already crossed. In fact, when he referenced it in a letter there in November of 1777, um, he said that Horatio Gates's officers had stayed with him at the plantation that he bought. And that Daniel Morgan and his men had already crossed the Delaware to join Washington's army in Pennsylvania, and that Gates' officers were sort of dining with them over a couple of days. So he did, like I said, he did reduce rates. And then from, you know, and he offered, it's been known at least in the receipts, he helped those members of these regiments, not necessarily the entire combat line. But from October 25th of 1780 to June of 1781, and we're almost at that point, the end of June, you know, beginning of June, it's only a few months out of, of Battle of Yorktown in October 1781. So it brings up, so he tried, he helped the, there's a receipt of being owed by John Nielsen, one of the uh, quartermasters, that he did help some regiments of the Continental Army go back and forth as they were you know, between the encampments of the Washington as encamped and getting away from the British. Um, but unfortunately, as May of 1781 happened, they decided to, after Trent had been running it from 76 to 1781, uh, they and it was known as the Lower Ferry, and or as the Continental Ferry. But they decided, at least voted on through Congress, that they wanted to move the Lower Ferry north. And they moved it to that previous spot where Daniel Cox ran the ferry. Um, it was now run by Hugh Runyon. And it would be a, a ferry then known as the Lower Ferry. So Trevor still run his ferry, but it necessarily didn't have the appease as, the, as before. And the Lower Ferry eventually would be up to, and this is the city today, present-day Ferry Street in Trenton. And they would use that eventually with Washington and Rochambeau would camp here, Rochambeau's camp here and cross Rochambeau's uh, troops and everything. And the artillery would cross using the ferry here at the uh, Trent House run by Hugh Runyon to cross eventually into Pennsylvania on a trip, uh, hopefully down to Yorktown by the fall of 1781. And these were the rates, you know, I talked about the rates of the ferry, but these were at the time in 1773, these were the rates of what it cost for a ferry you see. If you were just coming by yourself, it would be just uh, at this point, because we have uh, three shillings right here. I'm sorry, um, three pence. And then we have man and a horse is six pence. Of course, if it was you had a four wheel carriage, it's a lot more, three shillings. And it sort of gave you an idea, you know, if you had other type of animals that you were bringing over, maybe cattle, um, they would do all of that. And so apparently, according to the accounts, Trent would offer that in a discounted active Continental ferry, he would do one third of whatever these rates were. So if it was somebody just crossing by themselves, it was almost like just one pence instead of three. And this today, this is from Marine Terminal Park, going through, looking across, and it sort of gives you an idea. Like I said, this is how wide the Delaware was then. And they would cross to Pennsylvania, where of course there would be a boatman across that would send you back if you needed to come back to New Jersey. Like I said at the time, that was uh, John Tolton that was running. Pennsylvania, a little bit south of where Morrisville, Pennsylvania is, uh, would have been Bucks County. Today, it's sort of a, a sort of a swamp area of what was left of it. At the time, it was called Moon Island. Um, but today, that because of erosion and stuff, the island has sort of drifted into the land and everything. So a lot of the landscape has changed since then. So but despite all this hosting the, the um, you know, Gates officers uh, and getting them to the encampment after Battle of Terry, you know, a lot of trends either merchants, friends, or acquaintances, or men he did, you know, just had this with. His question of loyalty was still a question as far as um, whether or not he supported Great Britain or not. I mean, like we said before, William Trent was in the, was actually commissioned in the British as an independent company for the British in 1746. Uh, he basically was for the Virginia colony and for the crown of Great Britain for the French Indian, and was still doing so. He was the militia captain in Fort Pitt in during the Indian uprising there, uh, uh, Pontiac's uprising. So, 
you know, I said, so it was a matter of what exactly his allegiance was, but so we sort of, by doing so, it seemed like over the course of what he did, especially when he returned home and realized uh, what was happening, especially with the conflict breaking down there in the Revolutionary War, Trent would give his actual oath of allegiance to the Patriot cause. And this is the original uh, that's in Philadelphia, dated 1778, that he would say, we have turned the township of Nottingham County of Burlington. The state of New Jersey do hereby see that I do and bound to bear allegiance. Do not hold any or bound allegiance to the King of Great Britain. And that I do and will bear faith and allegiance to the governor established uh, in the state and the authority of the people of New Jersey. So it was at the time, uh, like I said, May the 29th, 1778, he gave this thing to the Patriot cause. Plus, it probably was shown earlier, like I said, with Gates staff staying there. Um, uh, Believe it or not, in 1777, the thing of Green would come by with supplies. In fact, there's an actual note that Trent would write in 1780 to Nathaniel Green saying that, do you remember when I lent you a pocket telescope uh, back three years ago and that I need it because I'm having problems seeing and I need that on my plantation? So apparently he, he had a pocket telescope or like a spyglass that he used uh, that he lent to uh, Nathaniel Green in 1777. Um, in fact, he gave it to uh, the, the bearer of the letter he gave to give to Green, who was camped about 30 miles to the south of New Jersey in 1780. He gave it to Colonel Richard Butler to take the letter. Um, and in the 1778, he also supplied cattle to the Philadelphia Cavalry, you know, if there was any question on this. And this was the cavalry that was based in not only in Philadelphia, but also had members in New Jersey as well. And he also supplied, when the Pennsylvania line came in 1780, almost two ton of hay for the Pennsylvania on that line. Uh, Anthony Wayne's men, uh, numerous other uh, members of the, that was the most famous of that legion um, that camped in the area. And he did what he could when, he, uh, when they were camped. So the other things there is, as like I said, as he got to the end there, as the revolution sort of came to a close uh, after the Battle of Yorktown, and there were just small fighting maybe in the South. But at this point, by 1781, you know, 82, 83, the war after Yorktown, uh, the Battle of Yorktown, basically Britain was sailing back and it looked like the end. So Trent eventually would be elected as a vestryman at St. Michael's Church in January 4th, 1783. And it brings up a, a thing here, and that's today what the St. Michael's Church looks like there on, on Broad Street. And the if you realize that St. Michael's Church, because it was an Anglican church, Church of England, had to close in 1776 because of the conflict between the congregations. Some were, you know, Patriot cause, some the Loyalist cause. They thought it was in the best interest just to close the church. The church was actually used, supposedly based on records, uh, some of the main fighting at the Battle of Trenton in, uh, that I mentioned earlier, when walking across the Delaware, actually happened in the back of the churchyard uh, there uh, at St. Michael's Church. But yeah, they reopened it there in January 1783. And uh, Trent was one of the listed members, about one of 15 vestrymen that were listed there. And he was also, he became a trustee of Trent Academy, which was also called the Trent School Academy, the Trent School Company. And uh, being a, a trustee that any of his kids could attend. And John Trent actually attended in 1782 and 83, which is probably the version of why uh, Major Trent decided to be a trustee to get a free education for his son, John, who at that time would have been about 14 or and this is the site of Trenton Academy. Today, if you visit Academy Street uh, in Trenton, that's what it's named for. Today, it's the, I believe, this, this is the section where it's the site of Trenton Academy. This is on the side of the Trenton uh, Free Library, for those familiar already. But yeah, it's neat to see that you know, it's at the side of the Trenton Academy and different things. That's what we're doing. Unfortunately, since 1781, and I go back to Elijah Vaughn, who in fact was actually a vestryman, as you can imagine, with Trenton St. Michael's. How that would have been. But since 1781, uh, as the lower ferry no longer was operating, Trent wasn't getting uh, the payments because he was still pay making payments to Elijah Vaughn. And in 1782, was sued by Vaughn for not falling behind on the payments. And to add insult to injury, that proposed colony of Vandalia that was, was facing opposition by George Washington, George Mason, Thomas Jefferson, all the future founding fathers. Uh, and unfortunately, was never approved. With the war and the conflict breaking out, there was no time to claim Vandalia or even remotely try to get this land back. 
Uh, and Trent would eventually face this opposition to Congress during the, the in fact, he would go as early as when he returned. He actually wrote to George Washington, newly named the commander in chief of the American you know, Continental Army. And as he camped there in, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Trent would actually write him in August of 1775 and want to know, hey, do you remember about a land deal we did back in the 1750s? And I, I think he paid for that. And it's funny, Washington's, they don't know the actual letter of what the land deal was, but Washington would respond uh, to it and say, obviously, I don't have my papers with me, and uh, I can't tell you offhand what I actually owe you. And in other certain terms, he was probably telling Trent, hey, I'm trying to organize an army here. This is the last thing I'm going to keep about it, stuff like that. But Trent would, you know, like I said, he would call back having the right to Congress. He would present himself to Congress in 1779, 1782. But unfortunately, it sort of fell in deaf ears. They bigger things to do. They were trying to run an actual when the war ended. They were just trying to form a government at that time. So the last thing they needed was to worry about somebody that was still trying to get debts from the French Canadian and previous conflicts. And unfortunately, like I mentioned before, the the, 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 uh, the spyglass or the pocket telescope. Trent actually, when he left England, there's a letter referencing. He wrote so many letters and focused on stuff for the royal courts. But Samuel Martin actually said Trent was blind and went out. And he was having problems doing so, trouble seeing. And he eventually was starting to show effects of basically like rheumatism, rheumatoid arthritis that was never being really treated for. And he might have even stemmed back from, he was, he was stricken with a bout of malaria back in 1748 when he returned home from another trip to London. And by doing so, it never it came and went, which is why they got the name intermediate fever. And eventually, it was never really treated. And eventually, he would have this problem where he was basically diagnosed with a scalp. Uh, he would have problems with tears, with headaches, of course, with blindness in one eye, and then the aching of wrists and legs. There were numerous times he was talking about it. So, as this sort of coming back in 1782, Trevor visited. This is in the actual account book of Dr. William Shippen uh, in Fourth Street in Philadelphia, and Trent would see uh, William Shippen. Uh, to basically, didn't say exactly what he suffered out of, but um, looking at it, it's pretty much the symptoms that you see here with blindness, headaches, uh, aching in the wrists and legs, because the diagnosis was sundry medicines and attendance for 16 weeks. And at that time, the only thing that they would use at that time, based on my research, was called the Portland powder. And it was a powder basically ground up with like ground pine and, and different mixtures, and apparently Dr. Rush would write about this in 1801, that it actually killed you more than it actually helped. And unfortunately, this was what led sort of the demise to Trent's health by taking this medicine. And he would eventually see a nurse named Mary Waters. He would actually mention her in his book. And it was always a mystery on who she was. Was she a servant? Was she, was she actually uh, was a, a um, what they call a doctorette. She's listed in the uh, Philadelphia in 1785, uh, Dr. Rush would actually write a sort of mini biography of her. And he'd talk about her, how she was crafted with medicine. Looks like Trent in his final days after seeing, you know, in fact, on this one, when he actually saw Dr. Shippen, he didn't actually even pay for the, he had somebody else in the army sort of pay for it. So he was still falling on hard times in March. In fact, uh, in March of 1782, Trent actually wrote a will. So you could tell it was, it was probably bad, whatever he had, the sickness and what he was feeling. Um, eventually, he would survive at least enough to keep conducting businesses and such. Um, but like I said, he would see that nurse Mary Waters probably to the end of his days. And in the final months, uh, like I said, the, because he was forced to and got sued, he couldn't afford the property. He went back to the lost lawn. He would end up selling it. He would give sort of a, a um, he would basically move to Philadelphia probably June of 1784 because he would go to Black Horse Alley and get a, um, he would see one of the, uh, like an appraiser of all the items that he had and was trying to sell off the house, at least to get some stuff before he could officially default it to Elijah Vaughn. Um, later it was, eventually it would appear uh, the house itself and the property at that time and even said there were 600 uh, roots, orchard trees, grafted trees. So, I mean, it's more of that. So he had a lot of stuff. There's a shad fishery. The advertisement is massive, all the stuff he had on this. Later, they would sell to uh, Mark, Mark Declan in 1785, but unfortunately, he probably had it maybe two months, and a fire, a house fire broke out, and it leveled the whole plantation of the ground in 1785. There was actually an article about it in Pennsylvania Gazette. Um, like I said, he, 
in Philadelphia there, it's, it's funny, you go know, to win on July 6, 74, would be his final goal. And there were no, as far as what I found, no other letters since then. Anything that he wrote in his actual handwriting. Which meant that his health was so bad. Was for somebody that's like George Washington would write and write and write or do account books himself, there was pretty much nothing left in his final days. Um, based on that will and, and where he was, it looks like to be on Fourth Street, probably the Indian Queen Tavern. The Indian Queen Tavern, which is in a sketch here, this is in the 1800s, but this is Fourth uh, Street here. Basically, the Indian Queen Tavern was was a propriety that the Trent would, have, would basically go and hang out with the rest of the guys when they were the sufferers. Before 1763, in Philadelphia, they would meet there. Franklin would meet with them um, when they were trying to get the restitution. Eventually, he would go there in 1780, 1781. There would be receipts, um, and he would hang out there. In fact, his will that he wrote in 1782, when he thought, you know, when I looked back at the previous slide, one of the uh, witnesses on that previous will in 1782 was Francis Lee, who was the tavern owner of the Indian Queen. Um, this right here might be hard to see, but this is actually says Taylor right here. And it's relevant because this is today, 4th Street, of, uh, where 4th Street meets Market Street. Today, this is the, actually the Fox 29 building of where that would be today, uh, to give you an idea. And um, the will witnesses on it. And that would be sort of the clue to where he wrote the will. Um, we see John, he was the Quaker schoolmaster. Um, uh, his son, John Todd Jr., would also be a person to try to leave uh, some uh, things for shares in the Ohio, uh, Indiana company, eventually that would be worthless because of the failed uh, Indiana track. Um, John Jr. would marry a familiar person. She would marry, uh, at the time, a uh, bigger person, Dolly Madison. In the future Dolly Madison with Major John Todd first. John Todd and his father would die in the Philadelphia Yellow Fever, 1793. She would eventually run into James Madison and then eventually become the future first lady. Uh, James Birchall was also a witness. He's a grocer on Fourth Street. John Martin was the tailor. This is the, probably the shop that he was at as well. His address at the time was 17 Fourth Street, so it would have been just as you go down. So that would be, make a reason why the Indian Queen is here. And uh, that was there. So the death of Major William Trent is referred to only one time. It's referred to in a letter um, that Thomas Clifford, Quaker merchant, would write to Anthony Todd, the postmaster of London, talking about how settling deaths and that William Trent died. Um, he would die basically uh, hanging with his friends, uh, helped by his friends, and uh, had poor sickness and succumbed to being poor. Um, it is based on being that he was either staying in the Indian Queen Tavern in his final days, or at least possibly with the Todds or one of the other gentlemen that were mentioned in that will. Um, like I said, the, the letter was, was dated December 27, 1784, but Clifford would write that Trent died um, on the night of the instant, December 1st, 1784. Um, and because Trent probably could not, do, uh, it's funny, the first two wills would mention funeral expenses, the third one does not. And it talks about he probably at that point was in the final did not have the money to do so. Um, it, it look, from what it looks like or what it's based on evidence, uh, a block over from Fort Street uh, or a block or two, uh, it looks like Trent was probably buried in the, the closest potter field or where they buried the people that were poor, couldn't afford it. This is, this is what was then known as Southeast Square, today it's known as Washington Square Park. Uh, it's, it's not only home to 20,000, at least what they know, 20,000. Veterans of the war, um, or but it's also uh, enslaved people. Um, they've done numerous things. And they have like a tomb of the unknown soldier here, but it's more than likely at that time, 1784 in December, even if it was winter, um, he was probably buried just a block or so over across the street, just thrown in the burial there. Well, it's now you know, the, the giant Washington Square Park in Philadelphia. So to sort of do here what happened to the children, just give you a final epilogue here to conclude. So wife Sarah, who was still living at the time uh, when he perished, uh, would live in a boarding house, and we know this because she comes up in the, the records, it's not only 1790 on the census in the Northern Liberties, but in 1791 shows up in the Philadelphia directory, her and along with like three others show up as the same address, so it assumes basically based on that that it was probably a boarding house that she was staying at. And the Northern Liberties at that time was sort of made what they consider sort of the proper district of 
from the uh, at the time in the 1790s. So it's possible that's Barbara, you know, based on the evidence, that's where she was living. And then eventually she is listed uh, dying in Trenton on March 26, 1801. Um, not much. There is a mention in one of the old Trenton papers about it, but it doesn't say how old or does it say where she's buried. Um, just to show you, that was her signature off the original. Um, we have daughter Mary. It's, and you have to understand the, the kids that survived. Uh, he had a daughter, Sarah, that I mentioned in the previous as well. She died in 1778, uh, young as well. He's only about in her teens. Um, died of an illness because he does mention in the letter in 1778 that uh, both his children were, and his wife were very sick. And he wasn't sure if they were going to make it. Uh, apparently, the, the wife and one daughter did. Um, but the daughter, Mary, um, she ended up marrying Nathan Beeks, a very, uh, you know, Trenton name at the time, especially as far back as when the Quaker settlement was here. And they lived on the plantation that would be on present-day New Willow Street, Trenton. Um, she died, according to the records, in Trenton in 1840. And that was her signature on the final. She was considered the executor of the, of the will, eventually would pass along to his creditors because he owed so much money. Uh, to some of the Jewish merchants in Lancaster, Joseph Simon and, and uh, one of the Gratz brothers, and Moses Franks. Um, we have Anne Trent, uh, his oldest. Uh, she married a Samuel Raymond, formerly of Massachusetts, and they lived basically in Ewing Township. Uh, she died between Ewing and, Lane, and Lawrence, because there was numerous times where she referred to either, and died on September 12, 1826. And this is the article. It said, after a short illness, Anne Raymond, uh, Samuel Raymond, and granddaughter William Trent were the original proprietors of Trenton, from whom it takes its name. And to give you a little bit more tidbit on that, Samuel Raymond, I see formerly in Massachusetts, Samuel Raymond was a marble header and actually crossed the Delaware, which was in Colonel Brothers group, crossed the Delaware in 1777, and uh, became part of Washington's lifeguard, the bodyguards that went through there. So, one way along the line, you figure, Trent would run into him, or Anne Trent would run into him somehow as Washington, possibly when they came to Trenton, took over the town, being they were a mile and a half away. And uh, like I said, they would marry a, a person in the Continental Army because eventually you'd see the pension records uh, of him being in uh, the lifeguards for Washington. And finally, son John, the youngest, would study a little bit at the School of Medicine and would apprentice under Dr. James Huddis. Hutchison and Dr. William Shippen uh, became a doctor of physique and would basically practice in Camden, South Carolina. And he died in Camden there, December the 9th, 1809. That's his grave. You can visit his grave in Camden for hard to see, but it's, it's hard to make out even in present day. So, uh, so he died in Camden, uh, South Carolina in 1809. Lived, lived in Trenton until about 1792, and then eventually moved down south. Still working on whether or not why he moved to Camden. Uh, there were rumors that he supposedly worked in Charleston, but I've yet to find the evidence for that. But so, but in actuality, that's what basically happened. And uh, as far as Major William Trent, so thank you. Thank you. And a couple of uh, questions sure. or comments. One was um, a comment about uh, about the vest. Yes. And suggesting that we contact someone. Uh, in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, who's uh, an expert, so we should okay. we'll find out more about sure. uh, more about the best that way. Um, and then uh, someone else was um, speculating that Trent maybe really was a loyalist, um, but a lot of what you had said as evidence that he might have yeah. been a patriot might have been because he was a businessman and was yes. you know selling things you wanted to. Get uh, yeah, people numerous, figure, numerous merchants at the time. I mean, some did declare that they were loyalists, but most of them at the time, especially, I mean, I mentioned it before, but William Franklin was a loyalist he, he dealt with, but he was also friends with Ben, who wasn't, you know, was a yeah. patriot, of course, and, and the majority of them. So, yeah, his, it was because his business partners or former partners that he had, a lot of them were either considered loyalists or not. So, that's pretty much why, you know, as far as on the fence. But yeah, as far as, and I think, to be honest, I think. Trent could claim Vandalia, whether or not it's, I think, you know, like we did in the previous talk, uh, basically talking about Dr. William Bryant was the, you know, as we watched that one here previously, if he was a loyalist or not. I think the same thing with Trent, he was one of those members of Trenton where 
they're trying to stay out of it. And they're probably just trying to, at the best, at least in Trent's case, was trying to just claim the land and get the debts back. Either, you know, if he had to go through the the parliament or, or Patriot cause or whatever, but at least he could, he would get it any way he could at this point. Not necessarily pick a side. No. Any comments or questions? To the yes. Yeah. Uh, well, too, just to piggyback on that comment, I did attend a lecture a few years ago about Trent and Joe Newton's times, and uh, the gentleman uh, talking said that the feeling was they were businessmen and they just wanted to open those doors and sell. Yeah. So whoever was buying that week is who they were <laughs> to. Yeah, and it's, and it's, it's unfortunate because I think if the Revolutionary War doesn't break out, um, and it's just impeccable timing because he comes back to find the colonies sort of an uproar at this point. I mean, they're hearing about it when he's in London. He's he does. There are certain references where, you know, they're telling him that oh, that you know, they, he mentions one thing about the Boston Tea Party, how they're all complaining in London about it, about what happened in Boston. And he he references it, and then you look at the dates, and you're going, okay, now I know what that what was going on. And it's yeah, and the, the thing is, if the Revolutionary War doesn't break out, he probably tries to go and claim this colony, and they just move on from there. I, I don't think it really at, at this point. Yeah, I, and I think it it's hard to say what exactly he he did because, like I said, he was at that event stage. Yes, he was, and he did supply most of the American. Uh, in fact, he actually in '75 when they had those committees of protection or, or committees of um, uh, basically committees of safety. Um, he had his goods looked at and, you know, they, they let it go and, and didn't say anything about it. They did actually, you know, I didn't mention it in this, but they, Trent would sail back from, from London on the Sally in April. It was April the 24th, I believe, 1775. Um, there is a letter referencing him leaving on April the 21st, 1775. I'm not realizing that Lexi Conkers happened two days earlier, obviously. You know, the news doesn't travel that fast. And he leaves on this alley, but there's known on that ship a British spy named Philip Skeen. They know this, and because it's, they, they reference it in the, in the, uh, the letter that Samuel Wright, Wharton writes to Benjamin Franklin. Franklin is already in Philadelphia at the time. And as they're returning, hopefully, back to the colonies, uh, Skeen organizes a overthrow of the ship and actually tries to take over. They eventually... I guess the captain really takes the ship back and they sail to Philadelphia this time. I guess the initial, the, the English supporters on that ship, at least apparently there were more than they thought. And eventually they would try to sail to Boston to join the rest of the British that have already sailed out. And eventually they would sail to Philadelphia. John Adams, Franklin, every founding father that was in that Continental Congress shows up and they arrest Skeen immediately and they take him and question him at the new tavern, which eventually becomes the city tavern. But they take him right in Philadelphia, and then there's a big account about that. Not necessarily Trent's account, but a account that, yeah, on the ship that Trent had. He had papers for Benjamin Franklin on that. He was carrying, in fact, they even say we trust Trent with them because there's nobody else we would trust on this ship going back. So mm -hmm. from anything from day to one, it seems like he seemed to be through and through was always a patriot. He didn't do the, the loyalty thing until 70, 78, but it seems like through and through, at least based on the evidence that he you know, best, definitely was through the patriot cause. Excellent job. Very nice. Thank you. I have a question, or just yeah. maybe a comment, um, okay. you know, about the debts. I mean, his father also got yeah. himself in, in a lot of debt. And um, the precariousness of the financial situation, even of people who were seen as wealthy and high status and so on, it's really... Remarkable. Yeah, because you figure in 1754 and 56, when they were able to, him and George Crone got royal, like a sort of forgiveness thing for like 10 years. And then when King George II took over there, um, he sort of nicked that <laughs> in the bottom. Ended up eventually the creditors came after Trent again, but eventually he was able to give them you know payment again. And but then he still owed thousands. I think it was one point, I think, is 1754 and 56 debts alone were probably in, you know, 10,000 pounds at least. And then 1763, all the goods he lost at Port Pitts and other settlements, he, he had 4,000 alone. And then he was part of a bigger company that joined the Ohio company. They owed close to 25,000. So he was in over his head, so to speak, on, on a lot of the debts. And unfortunately, if the Vandalia grant would have happened, at least for the time being, might have at least... Paid it off, but eventually 
he would just keep buying more and more land, hoping that something would open up. I mean, he figured he spent almost 30 years of his life just trying to get back deaths from 1754. Mm-hmm. You know, and unfortunately, he, as you can see, he didn't even, he couldn't even pay the house at the end. Uh, you know, it's a shame. It's, that was the time actually, when you were, you were dealing with that type of stuff. Right. Although it's interesting that people continue to give him credit somehow, or, you know, extend yeah. credit to him. Right. Um, you know, so maybe he was very persuasive. I mean, he, yeah, he, those shares, he ended up, the Indiana company was sort of, you know, like I said, the Indiana tracks and he had that Indiana company. He was still just at that point having meetings up till 1783, still hoping that this would open up when the Red War ended. And he was, then he started selling shares as well, even he was giving his, mm-hmm. his kids shares. He sold 300 shares to John Paul Jones. I mean, it was, he sold them whoever was buying them. And unfortunately, they ended up by the end of the war, after he died, they were pretty much worthless. Mm-hmm. Because eventually then the ordinance comes in in 1787 and then it erases everything that even Virginia's claim. <laughs> it's, everything started over, you know, what they were trying to do. Thank you very All much, right. Jason.